Hello and welcome to our midweek Bible study. I announced the last week in finishing up the study of the uh, 12 minor prophets that this seemed to be a good time to do what we've said for a period of many months we would try to do, and that is have a bit of a systematic study of the history of what we call the silent years, those 400 years between the time that Malachi lived last book of the Old Testament, and the events that we read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we're calling this the period between the Testaments. Uh, we won't spend a long time on this. Might be able to finish up even by the end of next week if the Lord wills. Uh, but I may want to go take an excursion into something about the apocryphal books. And... Um, we need to know they were written during this time period, and we may want to say something about that. But as I said, approximately 400 years intervene between the close of the Old Testament period and the opening of the New Testament account of the life of Christ. Now, let's remember that when we speak of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're speaking of four separate accounts of the one gospel. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's account, and together, all four of them, give us all the evidence that is needed to prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God and the Savior of the world, John 14, verse 6. But what we have happening in this 400 years is the fulfillment of many prophecies made in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Daniel. When you look at the changes that occurred during this period, and I've used this illustration before, there's 400 years. Well, think about the changes in this world over the last 400 years, where there have been many. So dramatic historical changes occurred during this 400-year intertestamental period. So those uh, who followed me in my comments at different times as I interspersed these things, as we studied uh, books of the Bible, I know that a new world power came to dominate the world by the time we get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. A new language, a wholly unknown, at the time of Malachi, became dominant throughout the whole Mediterranean world. And the social status of the Jews was significantly altered. Economic conditions changed, governments changed, and so forth. It was this new set of conditions which constituted or put together what Paul wrote about in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, as the fullness of time, the exact right time for Christ to come into the world, to realize the eternal purposes of God in Jesus Christ. It's important for Anyone who is studying, seriously studying the Bible as the infallible, inerrant, all-sufficient, and final revelation of God to man, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, to have some basic understanding of what happened during this 400-year period. Now, of course, as in any historical study, you could spend a long, long time uh, studying all kinds of details that have come down to us regarding this 400 year period. Well, we're not going to do that. Uh, some don't like history anyway, but I assure you it's very interesting to read about what transpired during this period, especially as it involved the Jews, but even the whole Mediterranean world. So as we do this study, we want to basically round out any study of the Old Testament, since we just finished the 12 minor prophets and some of the things that we studied about that they addressed 
came to pass, as I said also Daniel, a major prophet, wrote about, then it would be good to round all of this out by showing what happened to Israel or the Jewish people and their territory in the period between the Testaments. Now, let's begin with the Jews under the Babylonian uh, dominance. First of all, a brief survey of Old Testament history causes us to deal with certain dates. And the first date is 930 B.C. This is when we think Solomon, King Solomon died and you had the division of the United Kingdom. The 10 tribes that turned into the kingdom of Israel in the north and Judah and Benjamin in the south. Judah was a much larger tribe than Benjamin, so thus it's usually referred to as Judah. Now we won't go into what the Bible says concerning the outright foolishness and stupidity of Rehoboam as to what he did in listening to the young men his own age and not listening to wiser counsel from the older men that gave Jeroboam all he was looking for. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, had already left, running away, if you please, from Solomon and gone down into Egypt. Well, we haven't got time to do this, but a prophecy was made concerning Jeroboam, and he knew about this, that he would end up with the kingdom of the 10 northern tribes. So with the death of Solomon, Israel came into being under Jeroboam, 10 tribes, and the southern kingdom of Judah made up of two tribes under Solomon's son, Rehoboam. That was uh, roughly in 930 B.C. Then, coming on down quite a ways, in 721 B.C., Samaria, the northern kingdom, fell to Assyria. And this was the beginning of the exile of the northern kingdom that never made an appearance again like the Jews who returned from Babylonian captivity. Then we come down quite a ways to 606 BC. This is when Babylon becomes the dominant force in the region. And of course it came from Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers. And it um, had overthrown the Assyrians. And it became predominant after the battle of uh, Targamesh. Now, when it came into uh, Judea, it came under Babylon, who was headed by, or whose king was, Nebuchadnezzar. This again, I say, is 606. That's the first invasion. It was then that Daniel and others of his caliber, of his state, were taken into Babylon, Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Then the second invasion, 597 B.C., took away, you might say, the middle class, those people that had that kind of work. We wouldn't call them that back then, but to help us understand it, they were the artisans and others. First class at 101 606 were more of the rulers and those educated to rule, such as Daniel did. And then in 586 BC, Jerusalem, its walls, and the temple was completely destroyed, and who remained there were taken away into Babylonian captivity. Now, they were warned. And they were told, you're going to go into captivity for 70 years. We start counting that 70 years with the first invasion in 606 B.C. 
So we have the captivity, the duration of the captivivity, covering from 606 to 536 BC. And for lack of a better way to put it, this gave rise to, not as it's necessarily defined today among the Jews, but to what we shall call at that time, Orthodox Judaism. And you know, when you come into the life of Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can see that the synagogue is an accepted thing. It's routine in their culture. But when you close Malachi out, and before that, you never read of a synagogue. The synagogue was developed during the Babylonian captivity. It became, because there is no temple, the dominant institution of Judaism. It was not only a place where they had the law read and the law studied and where they did worship as they could, which they couldn't as prescribed by the law because there was no temple. But it was a place where they kept their national identity, even though they were in captivity. So the synagogues arose during this Babylonian captivity. There was a class of men known as the scribes who became increasingly important to where you see how that that term is used with reverence and in the place of importance that the scribes had during our Lord's earthly ministry. Of course, to be a scribe is simply to be someone literally who is writing things and is a copyist. And of course, if you study anything about the transmission of the Old Testament text, you'll find that they had developed a set of guidelines that caused that text when it was copied to be uh, almost infallible as far as mistakes in it. Because if they made one mistake, if they copied 99% of a page, they threw the whole thing away, started over again. That'll give you a little bit of how rigid they were. But the scribes came to be known as those who know the law. You know, if you sit down and, and copy a book and you're reading it as you copy it and you're paying attention to every letter or we might say every jot and tittle, you're going to tend to learn what's in that book. One of the reasons we don't know our Bibles today is because if we can get anybody to read it at all, they don't pay much attention to words and the meaning of words and context and remote context, immediate context, the meaning of words as they were used by the Holy Spirit 2,000 years ago in the New Testament and in how words are used today. We haven't got time to give that much, I guess you'd say, effort to the study of the book that will judge us all on the last day. But the scribes did a good job at that part of it. They came to be known as an important group of people. Now, the exile produced what is called the diaspora, the Jews of the dispersion, because many of those exiled never came back to their homeland. They made a home where they were. And they stayed there. So when you come down to the day of Pentecost, as Luke records in Acts 2, and you see a list of all those Jews, you see they're gathered from all over the place in the world of that time. But they were still loyal to the law, even though during the days of Christ, the Jews who were brought up and reared and trained in Jerusalem and Judea looked askance, to say the best, at Jews who came from outside of Judea. They had quite a bit of suspicion. But be that as it may, we see that there were devout Jews, according to the law, who lived outside of Judea, and they had for a long, long time. Of course, Saul of Tarsus, Tarsus in Cilicia, was one of those. And you couldn't be more dedicated to the law than Saul was before his conversion. Now, let's look for a moment at uh, what we'll call the Persian period. Remember when Daniel in chapter 2 of that book 
reminded Nebuchadnezzar of the dream that he had and then interpreted the dream. He said that uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the Babylonian kingdom, is the head of gold. And then the next one was the Persian Empire. So if you're going to study the events of the 400-year period, you have to know the impact of the Persians in the formation of the culture and society that we have existing as we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or as we read any of the New Testament. Now, things even change from their day, but at least there was a change from the Medes and Persians uh, from the way that the Babylonians did things. Um, the Persians conquered Babylon under their king Cyrus in 539 B.C. Cyrus uh, appointed, uh, well, you may call him Darius, and some call him Darius, the Mede, as what would be called in secular history, a vassal king, one who was subservient uh, to uh, Cyrus, who was back over uh, in the area of where we know Babylon was, and basically in the area of Iran today. And Cyrus gave a decree. And the reason he did that is that he became a benefactor of the Jews. He liked the Jews. You say, well, why? I don't know, and I don't know there's anything in history that tells us why. Except that you did have the influence of men like Daniel in the government. And um, one of the things you want if you've got to put a, a, a person in a position of power and responsibility, is someone who is honest and will get the job done right. And all accounts we've got, because Daniel lived to be in his 90s, and yet he came as a teenager, is that he had great influence on those people. So Cyrus issued a decree in 536 B.C., which permitted the Jews to return home back to Israel, back to Judah, Jerusalem, to rebuild their temple. Now, the first group left, and they numbered around 50,000 people, and they were led by Zerubbabel. When they got there and got settled in, they started rebuilding the temple. And the foundation of the second temple was laid in 535 B.C. But it wasn't long to they became discouraged, and you'll remember our study of that in Minor Prophets. And they just quit and started tending their own personal affairs, let the temple stay just with its foundation. After a period then that passed of about 15 years, the people finally completed the temple, this is where we were studying earlier, under the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. This was between 520 B.C. and 515 B.C. It was finished then at that time period. A later Persian king, and those of you who are somewhat familiar with that history or you may have taken in college of courses on civilization as freshman and sophomore year, a king by the name of Xerxes in the Bible is a Hazarius. And you'll remember that uh, he married a Hebrew maiden. That all took place about 480 B.C. And God in his great providence, which is one of the marvelous lessons, if not the lesson that is derived from that book of how God, without even working a miracle, took care of his people, spared the Jews from destruction, and we may say certain destruction of their race, when Haman, who was very much of an enemy of them, had tried to work things out to destroy them. And that makes a very interesting study. So there's another book that was written about the Jews of the dispersion that involved by name Esther and her uncle and how God providence works to preserve his people. Then we come 
to Artaxerxes I. He allowed another return of Jews to Palestine, and they were under Ezra. And that was at about 458 B.C. Now, Ezra was a preacher. He was a teacher of the law, according to Ezra chapter 7 through 10. So that's what he did with the people. Now, one of the things that needs to be emphasized here, remember, we're still in the text of the Old Testament now. One of the things I'll be interested, emphasized here is that some people say, well, there is no biblical authorization for a restoration principle. Well, in the Old Testament, that's exactly what's going on here. They had been far removed from Jerusalem. There was no temple. They had the law. And when they came back with that divine pattern or blueprint, they were able by learning the law to put things back in order in Judaism as taught in the law of Moses. Of course, we can do the same thing today with the New Testament of Jesus Christ. So when certain ones try to say, well, the New Testament's not a pattern, the restoration principle is not biblical, et cetera, et cetera, well, you're going to have to deal with what inspiration records of just how these people, like Ezra, who taught the law, put everything back in order. You remember when David realized that he had not followed the law and moving the Ark of the Covenant from Obed-Edom to uh, the city of David. And Uzzah died when he put his hand to the Ark to steady it because they were transporting it contrary to the way the law said that you find out that David said, as they learned better, went back and read the Bible, in other words, as to how God said the Ark ought to be transported and who was to transport it and how it was to be done, that he said, we sought him not after the due order. The due order is in the authority of God's word. And that's what Ezra's doing in teaching the law of Moses to these who have returned from Babylonian captivity. He's teaching them the pattern of Judaism found in the law of Moses so that they can restore everything that God wanted them to do as they approached him under the law of Moses. Now, Nehemiah asked and received permission to return to Jerusalem for the express purpose of rebuilding the walls of the city. And that was done in 445 B.C. During this period, uh, we would say a period of return, a great hostility, to say the best, grew between the shall we call them the repatriated Jews and the people who had settled in Palestine in the Jews' absence, especially the Samaritans. Now, this is where a great amount of the animosity that we read of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John between the Jews and the Samaritans developed. Under Ezra and Nehemiah, a great revival of devotion and worship according to the authority of the law took place. Now, really, it's here that the Old Testament account ends. And actually, the 400 silent years uh, settles over the land. So with that in mind, we need to realize that that continued on until John the Immerser, the forerunner of the Christ, began his work, 400 years. Now, Persian dominion lasted approximately 100 years after the close of Old Testament history. Now, when you go back and look at the dreams that were had and interpreted in the book of Daniel, you'll find another kingdom would arise after the Persians. 
And that was the Greek Empire, for lack of a better way to put it. It had been predicted by Daniel. And all I would say here is that you need to go back to read the old book of Daniel, but especially with what we're talking about now, Daniel chapter 2. Now, to back up a little bit, um, Philip of Macedon succeeded and united the Greek city-states under one ruler. Here is where someone ought to do some study of the Greeks just to see how they functioned before Philip united all of them. Philip ruled from 359 B.C. to 336 B.C. Now let me pause here and say we're talking about from Greece at this point Macedonia, actually, technically, it's not a part of Greece, but it really is as far as culture and language. We're talking about from here through what is known as Asia Minor or today Turkey, all the way over to Israel and down into Egypt, and as far as Alexander the Great's concerned, all the way over to India. But there was somebody doing something back over in Italy. And although we don't notice it here, that was the Romans were beginning to put together things in the boot of Italy. You'll notice more about that later, maybe. But they were still not the predominant power by any means at this time, but they were there, and they were growing and developing in the boot of Italy. We know, of course, Philip's son, his very famous son, better than we know Philip when it comes to the history of Greece. And, of course, that's Alexander the Great. I, I liked one time what a history teacher said. When you come down through the ages and people who lived that long ago and they still call them Alexander the Great, or in the case of Russia, Catherine the Great, the Empress, or in Germany, Frederick the Great. So that was an accident. Those people did outstanding things beyond the normal. And that's certainly true with Alexander. He succeeded his father, who was murdered, by the way, assassinated in 336 B.C. And he ruled till his tragic death in 323 B.C. at about roughly 33 years old, somewhere around that. He died of a fever in Babylon. Now, when he started his conquest, he came out of Macedonia. He went all the way through to overthrow the Persians, who was their ancient enemy. So he went through uh, what is present-day Turkey. He came down then through what is Palestine. He came into Egypt, and from then he went back and started over and went all the way to uh, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, and which are still there under the Medes and Persians, and on he went. So Palestine came under his control in 332 B.C. Now, mind you, he lived a very short life. At 18, he was commanding armies, if you please. He was a unique person. But we won't spend any more time on Alexander. There's no telling how many books written about him, and uh, you can read those. Now, since the Jews had submitted peaceably to the Greek invasion, I might pause here and say they couldn't do anything else for the helpless. The Greeks allowed them, as the Persians had, to maintain their religious autonomy. And that was a good thing as far as the Jews were concerned. But now remember, Alexander the Great saw himself as the apostle of Hellenism. The Hellenes were what the Greeks called themselves. So Hellenism is the culture of the Greeks, and they thought it was the only culture that mattered and that everybody ought to imbibe in their culture, speak their language, think the way the Greeks thought, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when he went in to conquer a place, it wasn't just to take over and have power 
it was literally to convert all of the people of that country to becoming a Greek and all that that meant at that time. So guess what happens when you come down to Palestine and Galilee and Judah and Jerusalem? You see, uh, Alexander the Great thought unity could be found among all the peoples of the earth through the unifying element of Greek culture. That was his idea. And that's why he was such a zealous person to getting everybody to be persuaded to be Greek, if you please. Conquered people were strongly urged, if not forced, to adopt what is called the Greek way of life. And that's such a strong thing in the mind of Alexander and those immediately around him that after his death, that Hellenization continued on. That is the Greek way of life to get everybody to believe it and live it continued on throughout the Mediterranean world. Now let's pause again and remind ourselves what is gradually growing over in Italy. I'll pause here and simply say this. The Romans didn't come up with a lot of new things, but they were probably some of the best, if not the best people in the world to be able to take what somebody else invented and make it a whole lot better, make it work better. And they certainly were regarding what the Greeks originated. You had traders, you had merchants, you had travelers. All of these, influenced by the Greek culture, helped bring that culture into Palestine. You had Greek buildings. We still talk about the Greek theater. You go in that part of the world and you'll find uh, all sorts of ruins with Greek theaters and columns. And if you take any courses, an introduction to various art, you'll learn about the kind of columns and you'll learn about uh, Doric columns and you'll learn about the, the kind of capitals on the columns and all that kind of thing. All started back then. Romans continued on with it. The theaters and the baths were all a part of the Greek culture. And they were erected wherever the Greeks were. And the Greeks were, of course, like Americans, all caught up with sports. That we know is where the Olympics started. And they pursued these things with great vigor and inspiration, even had Paul used that kind of thing when it came to saying how a Christian ought to strive to win the race and live in the Christian life. So all these Greek ways of life, these Greek cultures or custom were adopted. Now, the most important aspect of the process of what we'll call Hellenization, as far as our purposes are concerned in the study of God's word and seeing the influence of these of what happened in these 400 silent years till we get to the New Testament, is that they all adopted the Greek language. We know it is Koine Greek because it was the common Greek that everybody spoke. They spoke their own dialects and they spoke their own hometown language. Most all of them spoke Greek and that way they could communicate with one another. And for 600 years, 300 to 300, 300 BC to 300 AD, this was the common tongue of the Mediterranean world. It didn't mean the Romans stop speaking Latin. But when you read about Julius Caesar or you read about those fellows of his caliber, you'll find sometimes that they'll record they decided to speak in Greek to somebody for some reason, and they could switch back to Latin or they could write in Greek and Latin. So they knew about this. They were involved in this. They were impacted by this. 
So this language, the Koine Greek, provided the perfect vehicle for the church's preaching of the gospel of Christ in the first century and for the language in which the New Testament of the Lord could be written. Now, when Alexander died, as I mentioned earlier, as you might guess, fighting broke out among his generals for guess what? Who's going to control the empire? But no single successor emerged. So the empire was divided up. The empire was partitioned into four parts under four different generals who became four different rulers over each part. That is one ruler out of the four over a part. We're probably more familiar with Ptolemy. Ptolemy controlled Egypt. Another one is Seleucus, Seleucus, and he ruled what was Babylonia. And there was Antipater, all these were generals under Alexander, was over Macedonia and Greece. And Lysimachus controlled Thrace, another part of the area of Greece. But even though they divided up these places, they were not happy. Fighting among the four continued until only two, two major powers emerged. The Ptolemies of Egypt and the Seleucids in Syria. Need to keep that in mind. All this developing in that 400 year period. Now, Palestine, remember how it's located between Egypt and Syria. You go to the northwest, there's Asia Minor. If you go to the northeast, you're getting toward the Mesopotamia and the land between the rivers of the Tigris, Euphrates, so on. So there was a great period of uncertainty because people way back before Alexander had met for battle right down there in the area of what is Israel. Under the Ptolemies, and that was from 323 to 198 BC, the Jews lived reasonably well under that rule. And during this time period, they continued to absorb Greek language and culture. And this was not... Uh, that which made a happy camper out of someone who really wanted to be a stickler for the law, but we'll hold that for right now. But the increased usage and commonality of the Greek language caused Jewish scholars who knew Hebrew as well as Greek and vice versa to meet in Alexandria, Egypt, and translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. We know that as the Septuagint or the LXX. The LXX means the 70. Those who are the scholars, that many scholars who translated it. This was around 250 BC. So the Old Testament in Greek was produced because of the influence of Greek culture in the language. It had become so commonplace. And that Septuagint became the Bible of the Jews of the dispersion, the diaspora. And later, it was the Old Testament Bible of the Christians. Now, under the Seleucids, remember Seleucus was one of the generals, and it was between Seleucus and Ptolemy that finally uh, the whole place of the world that Alexander had conquered was divided. From 198 to 166 BC, the Seleucids under Antiochus, sometimes people say Antiochus, but it's Antiochus the third, also known again as Antiochus the Great, won Palestine from the Ptolemies. That again was in 198 BC. 
But of course, he would continue to extend the process of Hellenization. Now, this is where, and, and I'm not going to stop and do the whole thing here, where a lot of what we have concerning what happened in Judea under the Seleucids and Tychus and others comes from the apocrypha books. Now, if you get a Catholic Bible, you'll find the apocryphal books are there between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Why aren't they in what has been called the Protestant Bible? Well, very quickly, let me say this. The Jews never accepted them as inspired of the Holy Spirit. That's sufficient. It was decided in a council many years later when the church had apostatized and turning in the Catholic Church that they would be considered part of the Bible, and that's how they came to be in there. That's a very short comment of how it came to be. But the information we have about this comes from First Maccabees, which is a part of the Apocrypha. And these are supposed to be books standing alone, but some of them claim to be additions to Old Testament books and so on. And very interesting study. But one best thing we can get out of this stuff is that uh, you find some history at that time of Judea that comes from them. Now, about 30 years later, things took a very terrible turn for the worse under Antiochus IV. He is known as Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes. He had been forced out of Egypt. Now we hear somebody for the first time in that end of the Mediterranean by this upstart, Rome from the west in Italy. He had had a victory, that is, Rome had, over the, Pal uh, over the Ptolemies. And uh, Rome was beginning to move that direction and consolidate their power and to take over. Well, Epiphanes retreated to Palestine. And uh, he was so mad at being defeated, he was full of rage, and he vented his rage and frustration on the Jews. We learn of that in 1 Maccabees chapter 1. And over the next two long years, he plundered Jerusalem, he murdered no telling how many, and he enslaved many more. He forbade circumcision. He stripped the temple of its treasures, and he desecrated the temple by sacrificing a sow on the holy altar. Again, you can read about that in 1 Maccabees 1 and 2 Maccabees chapters 5 and 7. You want to go read history of those people written at that time that we can't find a lot of other places. Now, at this time period, since we've covered quite a ways, I'm going to hold off till next week to cover the Maccabean period in Judea, which covered from 166 to 63 BC, 166 to 63 BC. If you want to go online or if you have books for that, you can go ahead and, and read a lot about that. As I say, we're skipping a multiplicity of details, but we don't need it for our purposes. So next week, if the Lord wills, we'll look at the Maccabean period in this time, this intertestamental period there in Judea. Well, we hope this has been beneficial to you. And like I say, when we ever, if the Lord wills, get back to meeting in the building and get back to our Wednesday night Bible geography, and some of this may be helpful to you as we study the lands of the Bible. Let's continue to pray that this COVID virus, COVID-19 virus, will be put out of the land. Trust in God to take care of us, to be mindful of our needs, pray for each other, never lose sight of regardless of what comes upon us. We're still obligated to God to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. 
Matthew 6, 33. God will take care of us. Our duty is to be faithful to him, no matter the sacrifices, and let come what may. Thank you, and at this time we bid you a good night and hope you have a restful sleep.